the world, the world's writers will walk through those gates. And uh, if you hang around, you get a chance to talk to them. I'm interested in conversations that deal with things that matter, that real, you know, how do we live our lives? First of all, make climate change personal in your life. The second step is get angry and get active. And the third step, and believe it or not, I think this is the most important. We have to imagine this world that we want to hurry towards. It's about kindness is looking at people as people and not as I voted this, I do this, whatever it is. There are some people we will never get along with, but most of us, most of us are a complex mass of different things. Hello, I'm Ian Rankin. Uh, I've been with the Edinburgh International Book Festival basically since day one. I went as a student, as a reader, as a fan of writing. Uh, later on, I was invited to go as an author, which was a thrill. And it's a spectacular experience. It's a meeting of minds. It's a way to open your mind to new experiences, to new ideas, nuanced debate, entertainment, something for every age group. And that's what keeps me going back year after year after year. Long may it continue. We are the Open University in Scotland. We are open to everyone, regardless of previous qualifications, background or location. I didn't think about going to university. It wasn't really an option for me at the time. I left school with no qualifications. At the OU, our courses and apprenticeships are designed so our students can fit their studies around their busy lives. The Open University in Scotland. Your ambition, our mission. Good evening and welcome to Edinburgh International Book Festival. I'm Noelle Cobden, I'm the Communities Programme Director here at the Book Festival and I am so delighted to welcome you along to Stories and Scran this evening, our first ever virtual community meal. This event has been made possible by the Open University in Scotland and the players of People's Postcode Lottery, so a big thank you to them. Stories and Scran is part of Citizen, which is the book festival's long-term creative programme, working in partnerships with organisations across Edinburgh and the Lothians, providing a platform for local people to come together and think about themes and ideas around self, place, community, and what it means to be a citizen in the world right now. Back at the beginning of this year, we had a grand plan to host a free community meal on our festival site in Charlotte Square Gardens this August. But as with everything to do with our festival this year, we've had to move things online and try to create a new version of a community meal virtually. Luckily for us, we've got some amazing partners working with, working with us tonight, the Scran Academy, and they, along with Leila Josephine and Eleanor Tom, our citizen writers in residence, were very much up for the challenge tonight to make this happen. Um, Leila and Eleanor have put together a wonderful programme of work from participants who've been working with us um, across Citizen for the last year or so. And much of this work was written um, during lockdown, but also before and after. 
And I'm really delighted as well that we've been joined in the studio tonight by Jeff Kemp and Emma Easton, both of whom have been involved in the Citizen Project um, from their communities over 2020. Over the course of this afternoon, our partner Scran Academy have been cooking and delivering meals to people across Edinburgh and the Lothians. And we have asked those people to join us slightly differently this evening. So you'll probably see them on your screen now. They are joining us via Zoom. And the reason we've done that is to try and help us really create a sense of community and connection for this evening's event. Um, We'll also be asking you to get involved this evening via the chat function, um, which you can do uh, via our website if you're watching on the stream. The chat room is just to the right hand side. You can click on the box and join in. But we'll come back to that in just a second. But for now, I'm going to pass over to Leila and Josephine, uh, sorry, Leila and Eleanor, who are going to be hosting this evening's event. Hi everyone, um, I'm Eleanor and it was lovely to see you there. Um, I'm speaking to you from my home in Edinburgh and I've been working with the Book Festival for about the past 18 months um, as the community's writer in residence. And this has taken me into different community groups with a focus this past year on Musselburgh and North Edinburgh. Uh, since lockdown, I've been able to continue uh, working with several of of the groups online. And more recently, I've actually been able to visit some of the participants outdoors uh, around Mid Lothian and East Lothian. And I've taken with me a very big fluffy microphone on a very, very long stick. So that even on windy days, we've been able to make some really good quality socially distanced recordings, which you'll hear tonight. Hi, my name is Leila Josephine and I'm a writer and poet based in Presswick, but originally from Glasgow. I've been schools writer in residence for the Bookfest since January and I was working in three primary schools in Musselburgh before lockdown and one high school in North Edinburgh. We've been trying to figure out new ways to digitally kind of reach these communities during this kind of crazy time. Over the past year, there have been so many creative and really exciting projects happening as part of Citizen that we've had to curate just a small selection to showcase this evening. Um, but this is going to be a virtual cabaret of film and poetry and prose and sketching and song and photography. Um, but if you want to explore more of the work that we've been doing tonight um, that we're showing you, please keep an eye on the Citizen blog, which is on the road.edbookfest co.uk and that's where you'll see all of the work from the year and tonight we're hoping that you at home are going to help us build a brand new poem that is going to go on the road blog on on the road blog <laughs> we'd like you to respond to this prompt in the chat box whether you're watching on zoom or you're online streaming and the prompt is a citizen is and we want you to finish that sentence. What is a citizen to you? What is a citizen to the world? And once you've done that, and we are gonna filter them all over the next couple of weeks, compile them all and put them in a poem, and we're gonna be able to display that on the blog in the upcoming weeks. So as you sit back and have a bite to eat, we're going to begin with three short pieces and these are read by members of the Brunton Citizen Writers Group in Musselburgh. Um, the writers met every week before lockdown and these pieces were all written with a very particular location in mind, um, one that you might be able to pinpoint on a map of the town. But the landmarks on this particular map are personal memories and moments that the writers have chosen to share with you. This is just a sample of our forthcoming Musselburgh audio map where you're going to encounter the town and its people. The brown massive leaves piled up on the beach at this time of year makes it hard for beach combing. We trudged along the sand, the cold wind blowing on the back of our heads and its hands pushing our backs onwards as if telling us we shouldn't be here today. As we rounded the corner to head back up the path, we noticed an antique chair proudly announcing itself on the dune. It looked ready for action, as if someone had just been sitting on it and had rushed off urgently to complete an errand they had just remembered they needed to do. I wondered if it had come from the sea, and on closer inspection it was indeed soaked through, the carved wooden frame softened by its time at sea. 
I debated with my husband whether we should carry it back home and attempt to revive it. But he was tired and the thought of carrying a heavy sodden chair across the links was not appealing to him for some reason that day. I slightly regret not forcing the issue, having a natural affinity for old weathered things. It was probably the most elaborate piece of driftwood we had ever found. Graffiti. My poetry is less slam than the sound of one hand mapping urban landscapes, dog pussy lanes, slap dash graffiti, streets theatrically tagged with growing anger, hissing directions to the shitty shanta, shifting attention from the road ahead to jagged, sore-toothed letters ripping your head. These supersized expressions are less Shakespearean than desperation seasoned into discontent graphically etched onto wasteland, using bricks as canvas and narrative as larger-than-life characters whose colour-filled language imparts quicker than eye blink darkness how symbols outsmart syntax. Since we interact with these gaudily painted walls we pass while multi-storied libraries just deride us into keeping silence, communication is simply hard to explain as spray canned entertainment or phrases made into territorial markings. Human communication is particularly bizarre as we find words which then form paths that bring us to who and where we are in the assembly rooms in Edinburgh with poetry in passing. When my youngest daughter was a month old, we visited my grandma in Stonybank Crescent up the steps to the upper villa so that she could meet the new baby. She was in her late 80s by this time, but still keen to hold her and give her opinion on the new member of the family. Solid, she said. She's solid. Fast forward 18 years, and my daughter and I were living together while her partner finished university in Dundee. She'd had her baby the week before, and now they were ready to come home. I was sitting on the sofa in the living room when she first handed him to me, and I'll never forget the surge of love I felt when I cradled his tiny body. He was calm, yet vibrant with life, a new person to discover, as he would discover the world. I spent ages just holding his weight in my arms, taking in every detail of his perfect little face. In the days and months to come, I found that even after a long day at work, the sight of his cheeky wee face would let all my fatigue and frustration melt away. We live apart now, but still spend time together. We visit museums and play crazy golf, and we tuck ourselves up on the sofa to read our books and discuss the intricacies of Minecraft. I'm a lucky grandma with close ties to the new generation. A small part of me strides into the future and I feel privileged that we had the time and opportunity to build our relationship on such a solid foundation. It feels like a long time ago, but um, this time last year, I was running several workshops at Craig Royston Primary. Um, with a really lovely group of um, P2 children and their families. And inspired by a picture book called Silver Buttons, which is by a writer called Bob Graham, um, we decided to put together a story about life in North Edinburgh. And this book was then illustrated with photographs that were taken by the families at home on their camera phones. So here's a trailer for you. On Saturday morning, the delivery man turns his small van into Muirhouse Place West, 
Above the rooftops, there is only a wisp of cloud. Charlotte's mum is ready to leave for work. The delivery man has a heavy parcel for her. Mum signs for the parcel and hands it to Charlotte and her cousin Taylor Jack. Open it later, says Mum, after you've helped Grandad walk Bruno. Bruno wags his tail and Charlotte and her mum kiss goodbye. The delivery man runs back to his van and a boy passes on a bicycle, going the other way. In the sky, the clouds start to look like something, but everyone is too busy to notice. At the same time, outside Bernie's court, Natalie and Leah pick dandelions. They look up as they blow on the fluffy heads and the seeds drift skyward. Natalie notices the cloud first. It looks like a magic lamp. She closes her eyes and wishes for a baby hedgehog. Upstairs, their mum packs a picnic for a trip to the zoo. They like round cheese and red wax and chocolate cookies. One dandelion seed lands on a gull's wing as it swoops over the flats. The gull flies to McGill Drive, where it perches on a lamppost. Through a window, the gull sees Sai's mum doing yoga. She stretches, reaching with one arm, then the other. Sai likes yoga too. He does ninja switches, hands splayed on the mat, feet swapping places forward and back. The phone rings. Outside the window, Sai's mum sees a cloud shaped like a magic lamp. It is beginning to loosen at the edges. The gull hears the phone ringing and it circles into the air. Oh, sorry, are we back on? Oh, I was just enjoying my little brownie there. All, all the tech people here are really jealous that I get my free meal from the Scran Academy. Can we have a little look at how everyone's getting on with their meal at home? Hi, everyone. Have you had your dessert yet? Everyone okay? Yeah, brilliant. As a community, we know how important it is to eat together and spend time together and have conversations together. And it might have felt like over the last couple of months, we've not been able to do that. And it's such a shame that we weren't able to do it in Charlotte Square this year. But thanks to Scran Academy, we've been able to do it digitally and enjoy our lovely brownies here. So thank you so much. You might not have heard of Scran Academy, but the work that they do is really incredible. They're a catering social enterprise that provide food that's not just good value, it doesn't just taste good, but it does good. If you want to donate, if you've enjoyed the meal or you're interested in the kind of work that they do, it's really, really simple to donate via their website. We're going to hear from Connor now, who is an apprentice at the Scran Academy, and what they aim to do is help with the transition from school life to work life. Let's hear from Connor. Hi everyone, my name's Connor Graham and I'm 17. Um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about my story and how Scran's helped me along my life um, so far. So when I was at the age of nine year old, I got put in foster care for a couple of personal reasons. Um, a lot to do with my family being unfit and unstable to look after me. Um, so. When I was put into care at age of nine, I was put with one specific family and they were amazing. They knew how to introduce me to a family. They didn't push me in. At first, it felt like I was just at a mate's house. Um, so like I didn't feel like I was pushed into a family too far. Um, so yeah, they weren't exactly the most experienced. No, they weren't, they weren't exactly like permanent cicaders. Uh, they could only take short term um, placements. So we, me and my little sister, we had stayed with them for about three and a half years and then after that, we had moved on to a different placement, uh, both to reach Rome. Um, so my little sister moved through to Dunfermline and I moved through to Kirkcaldy, which was a completely different scene for the both of us. We had never ever been with carers like this. They were both wealthy. Um, they, it was a completely different experience for us. Um, but yeah, so I was at, like, I, I didn't exactly cope very well with it. I didn't cope with the whole new family type thing um, because I had experienced it once already and it just it wasn't my thing I didn't enjoy being introduced to a new family um, I don't think it's anybody's thing but it just I didn't cope as well as others can cope to that so I eventually moved out of there because I didn't I didn't feel like it was the best placement for me because I felt like I was too rushed 
and I wasn't exactly coping very well. I was running away. I wasn't. I wasn't behaving. I wasn't doing anything in school. Um, so yeah, got moved out of there and put in an emergency placement in Edinburgh again. And then after that, I got put with other permanent carers, and I felt like it was way too rushed. Um, like they, they, I felt like they were trying to rush me into their family and get things started way too fast, and I, was, I just didn't enjoy that vibe. Um, it just wasn't it wasn't for me at all. So I eventually got put into a residential unit, um, where I moved into uh, Craig Royston High, and the when I was in the residential unit, I wasn't coping very well. I wasn't going to school because I didn't want to be in classes because I didn't know anyone. Um, I went and the, I, like when I went to school, I went to school like three times a month or something, um, and I was uh, constantly in the support for learning base because I didn't want to go to classes, didn't want to meet new people. I grew this massive fear for meeting people and going to new classes, things like that. Um, so yeah, it wasn't. I wasn't. It wasn't doing anything for me. I wasn't gaining qualifications. I wasn't doing anything with it. It just. It wasn't something that I wanted to continue doing. Um, so eventually Scran had started up and three weeks after that they had asked me to join um, and experience it for myself. So I did uh, and at first it was all skill based so if I didn't feel like it was working for me I could pull out again and go back to the base but the teachers that were involved and the volunteers that were involved they were very supportive and wanted everything for me like they wanted the best they wanted to give me qualifications they wanted to get me a job they wanted to get me everything in life that i wanted myself so eventually we started they'd grew and grew and grew and they supported with me with a lot of other things that like i didn't i didn't actually feel like they could have supported me with that but they still did they managed it very well um so one of them was moved back to mums and um, they supported me in every way that they could with moving back to mums um, and then eventually I kind of sort of seen that that wasn't the best solution for me and I wanted to move out they helped me move out they supported me in finding a new placement um, and things like that uh, they also helped me f gain qualifications that I didn't gain through school like I did gain them through school but they helped me gain confidence to go back into classes and gain, like gain these qualifications so yeah it's been it's, it's been great um, they also helped me get into a college course uh, that gave, like that I gained some national force out of them as well um, and then after that they had helped me find a job the job wasn't for me, I'm no longer at that job but they still, it's, like, it's more to the fact that they managed to get me that job um, it's more to the fact that they managed to support me in getting things like that um, so yeah I, when I left that job, I went back to Scran Academy because I still needed to, I still needed to find what I wanted to do. Um, so they helped me with that uh, and they supported me with a few other things during lockdown. Like, for instance, lockdown happened and my foster carer passed away, um, my first ever one, um, on the 9th of June. And she passed away due to smoking. And I, I, I had smoked. So during lockdown, I decided, well, I'm going to stop smoking. I stopped smoking. They supported me and helped me find ways to stop smoking, they supported me in my choice um, and things like that. So I've stopped smoking for seven weeks now due to the support of Scran Academy um, and yeah. So now I'm just kind of, now, now all that's happening is just I'm getting a job. I'm going to get a job or an, or an apprenticeship, most likely an apprenticeship uh, and that's something that Scran Academy is still supporting me with. Um, they're still supporting me with everything I need, um, even during lockdown. Um, they, like, they support me from afar, which is quite extraordinary in a way, um, because obviously it's lockdown and nobody can actually support you right now. They can't give you a cuddle, but Scan still makes me feel like I can get a cuddle off them. And it's, it's things like that that matter. So, yeah. Thanks for hearing my story out. And yeah, thanks. Thank you so much, Connor, for sharing that. It's really important for us to be amplifying voices um, here at the Book Festival. And as you can see, Scran Academy are doing an amazing job at that. So please, please donate if you can. And also, can we get some of that lighting in here? That was amazing, flattering lighting. I don't know why we've not got some blue tints here. Um, so as Connor was saying, it's been a really strange time for lockdown, we all know it, it's the elephant in the room. And creatively, it's been really hard as well for people that write. 
Some people have been finding it really easy to have extra time, baking banana bread, taking up knitting, watching reruns of Tiger King and Normal People, that was me. Uh, but some have been kind of crippled by this anxiety and worry and the constant 24 news cycle and haven't really been able to pick up a pen. But some people have managed to do that. And one of those people is Jeff. And we're gonna hear from Jeff and some more of the citizens participating participants for some of the writing that they've been doing during lockdown. Yes, writing can be one way to process things that can't be changed, such as COVID. And this is the subject of space-time continuum. Iona, Lindisfarne, islands thinly divided from the next world, the simple act of walking their shores forms a pil pilgrimage, but time, not place, now shrinks the space between separated realms. Every morning, we find the mundane and unprecedented, waiting hand in hand to lead us through an inner landscape of habit and hazard, drab and beguiling as bog-pitted moorland sprawling around a sacred location, maps now replaced by a clock, stopped, slow, unreliable, our only guide across expanses hiding the threat of annihilation. Each of us an island of tidal breathing. We inhale belief that endurance redeems, then exhale exhaustion. Guesswork, ghost walk towards vague shapes caught between chaos and order. With each day more taken from our eroding shores. A walk during lockdown. I'm walking Missy, Mum's old collie, along the footpath. Glorious sunshine. Beneath the idyllic rural chirping of blackbirds, robins and sparrows is the gruff call of a collared dove. His persistent sound is not unlike a reversing bin lorry. White flowered pawthorns and cowslips line the path. I breathe in the pungent fragrance of invading nettles, recall the taste of the soup my brother made by cleaning, cooking and sieving the leaves up. An activity that took over Mum's kitchen for most of the day, but it kept the chef and his three small onlookers out of mischief. It tasted disappointingly of nettles. As a child who walked through summer barefoot and played the buzzcocks non-stop in her bedroom, my relationship with the village was troubled. I couldn't wait to leave it and its narrow-minded attitudes. As a middle-aged woman, I'm trapped here again because of lockdown and an elderly mother who needs more help than she'll admit to. Fake. I cursed after snagging my puffer. Where the track narrows, branches and brambles are starting to encroach. It's here, where keeping a two metre distance is just about impossible. I met her. The lightweight navy raincoat, with its 1950s sensibility, appears at first rather ordinary. I mistakenly peg her for a cleaner at Girton College. But the closer we get, the more tailored the coat reveals itself to be. When you're short and lacking a well-defined waistline, it's hard to cut an impressive figure a thing I've learnt from past failures. Unlike me, she's pulling the trick off. Deciding the grey bob would have been more stylish in normal times when hairdressers were still legal, I peg her for a retired academic. Finding a small clearing, Missy and I wait for her to pass. That's become a handy spot, she says by way of a thank you. She then decides that she's going to pat Missy. The stout gated 13 year old takes an unusual shine to the stranger and is whacking her large rump expectantly. Best not, I warn. The stranger alights on the black plastic grill of Missy's cone-shaped muzzle, which has an unfortunate Silence of the Lambs vibe. He's just like the rest of us, old and crabbed by being caged up all the time. The stranger's insight slips into humour and confession. Slightly cured up, we head off in our opposite directions. The stranger, whoever she was, was one of those lovely clever people you hope to meet again, but never do.
That's us already halfway through our event tonight. It's going so fast. Beautiful poems going on. Um, so my next guest, I feel like I'm on the news just now, uh, is a wonderful teacher that I am so happy that I get to spend some time with. Uh, she's really inspirational and she's probably my favourite teacher I've maybe ever worked with. I'm just going to put that out there. The others aren't here, so I'm allowed to say that. And um, she's from Spartans Alternative School. Um, I'd love to welcome Emma Easton. Hi. Hi, how are you doing? Good, glad to be here. Um, so people at home might have heard a little bit about Spartans Academy and the football settings, but they might not know about the alternative school. So could you tell the people at home a little bit about what you do there? Yeah, so as part of Spartans Community Football Academy's charitable arm, we run an alternative curriculum provision for S3s and 4s. So they'd be like 14 to 16 year olds who in the broad sense are at high high risk of underachieving due to multiple challenges in their lives. And perhaps some of them not stories unlike Connor's. Um, they are children for whom, or young people for whom, five days a week, six periods a day in a mainstream class with 20 to 30 others is just asking for more than they've got to give. So we are offering them um, through referrals from their schools to come to us for part of their week it's a very nurturing, different environment. It's youth work-led approach. We do everything different from mainstream schools, hence alternative. And we really just try to listen to them, take a learner-led approach, listen to what works for them, what doesn't work for them. And movement and football are an aspect or sport of various kinds. So they're children who find sitting still for long periods a challenge and we can build in lots of movement. So what are the kind of barriers that some of the young people might come into contact with when they're, you're trying to do you know, English and reading and writing? What is, what's that like? Um, over half of our group every year will have either diagnosed dyslexia and certainly literacy difficulties. Um, the, the literacy difficulties might just be from having a disrupted education or having to move schools and other challenges that have made it difficult for them to concentrate or learn. And we've just found that if we can find a hook that motivates them to want to access that, that text, whatever it is online, on an iPad, a text that is interesting and engaging to them, that they seek and find out and want to read, a lot of those barriers go away because obviously it is about relationships and building the connection with them. We're creating this safe space where they know um, they're not being judged. And often with teenagers, as we all know, your peers looking at you and judging you is a massive factor. So we're taking them into very small groups, often one-to-one, -one, creating this safe space, getting the hook and the motivation of the types of work or text that they want to access or they want to write about. And we take it from there and they fly. They exceed way beyond what they thought they could achieve and, and often you know, achieve more than their schools predicted they could because we can offer this different environment. And what are some of the kind of hooks that you've come across that you've managed to get people involved? I mean, it's so varied. I learn so much every time. And there was a reference to Minecraft from that grandmother. Uh, this week, I've been looking at a uh, boxer, um, Garcia, and the first name's gone for me. I've been looking at the, the motivations to improve your bleep test outcome. <laughs> um, it can be Call of Duty, Overwatch is another one, Rainbow Siege 6 is a big one at the moment. And, um, but basically I just say, go into Google, Google what you would, and they look at me confused. And I say, no, no, just if you were at home and went to Google, what would be the first thing you Google? And we take it from there. Um, and yeah, they, they, they do really respond well to it. And obviously I came in for a couple of sessions earlier this year, um, a couple of one-to-ones with the young people and doing a performance. And I loved seeing the way it worked. And like as a dyslexic person, like I know that if I'd had something like that when I was at school, it would have been like really important for my development. And I just like, just for those young people, it's like so important. And it's also got like a really fun vibe as well. It doesn't feel that like you're in a school. Um, and Obviously, we managed to get some poems out of some of them, and you've got a poem that we're going to share in a second. But just before we do that, would you be able to tell everyone about how they could donate if they wanted to donate to Spartans mm -hmm, Alternative mm -hmm. School? 
So um, go into the Spartans website, which is www.spartanscfa.com. <laughs> Google um, it. <laughs> uh, you will find it very easily. You will find the Donate Now button very easily. And if you click on it, you will see all aspects of the charitable arm of the Academy and lots of testimonies and little true stories of some of the young people that have gone through our alternative school. So yes, please do uh, have a good look and um, support what we do because it's really, really powerful. Great, let's hear that poem then. Okay, so another factor of what we do is we really try to empower the young people, let them find their voice. And we spend a lot of time listening to them and letting them know that they are properly heard and seen. So this is me trying to capture one of our 16 year old leavers from last year's voice. And I hope I do it justice. The way I am. I am a rainforest. You won't see me, I promise. I am Rio in Brazil. I come alive at night. If you're on your own, you might get a fright. I am purple and blue. I'm nothing new. I'm not ifs or buts. I am the future. I don't find you funny. Change your humour. I am spring and autumn. I am the beginning and the end. Anything you give me, I can mend. I'm a snowstorm, I'm not the norm. I can be cold. You should have done what you were told. I am the way I am. Indescribable to some, but I do know how to have fun. I am edible. You are high with me, the night will soar by. I am an eagle flying in the sky till I die. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, just before lockdown in March, I was working with the Musselboro branch of People First Scotland. And this is an organisation that campaigns to establish and protect the rights of people with learning disability. Um, the group members on the first evening I visited suggested the theme of keys. And it was interesting how this prompt um, inspired other groups. I took the idea to the writing group in the Brunton and also to some of the groups in North Edinburgh and then collected conversations and poetry. Um, and we created a collaborative kind of podcast. So what you're going to hear next is Dave's poem about a very familiar frustration on a cold day, followed by the members of People First discussing their lives and homes and the significance of owning your own key. So listen out for the sounds of the participants jangling their bunches of keys. If you speak to someone um, about what they keep on their key ring, I found it very surprising how much you can learn about them. The Key by Dave. I'm standing outside my front door in Fisher Row. What I think of is Musselburgh by the sea. The air is thankfully free of snowflakes, and I believe I'm only seconds from getting in out of the cold. It is three days from Christmas in this small East Lothian coastal town and I have bags to drop and central heating to turn on. But somehow the damn key falls from my grip when it doesn't fit into the keyhole. This atheist looks to the heavens and shakes his fist, quietly seeking divine intervention. But I calm down and things begin to fit. Someone else's God has smiled and gratefully, or maybe not, I tumble through the doorway. Now my life can continue. Hey, my name's Katrina. I'm a member of People First. Well, I think it is important for people with disabilities to get a choice in what kind of type of area they would like to live in. Um, my name's Keith Lynch, and I'm the chair of People First Scotland. People First is a, a user-led organisation, and it's a disabled persons organisation, which is run by people with learning disabilities, for people with learning disabilities. The aims are to give pe people with learning disabilities a, a voice, to get their voices heard and to get, make changes that affect people with learning disabilities for the better. This is a bus of a group. So I'm Sarah Allen, I'm the, the vice chair for People First East Lothian. I think the key to happiness is to have like fun, friendship, 
activities and adventure and to have a active uh, lifestyle because it keeps your mind at ease and, and to make lots of friends definitely and no it's good to have a active lifestyle because that helps with the uh, key to happiness. My name is Agnes. I'm a member of the People First and I've been there a long time. When I came to Massabra for the borders, I had my own key and I was happy about that because I never had one before. I started coming along occasionally to this group after meeting my current partner, who's now also my wife, who's a member of this group. We eventually got together February the 14th on Valentine's Day there. We also have a cat at home as well. Chico, he lives up to your name. I've never ever really lost my keys. Whereas uh, Keith has, he actually, the last time we were up north, we couldn't get into the house. Keith, he left his keys. When he locked the door he had to go out to people first, he put his keys through the letterbox. So when, uh, when we both came back home, we couldn't get in because the keys was the other side of the door. I was in St Mary's in the border and I didn't like it at all. It's a convent and you got locked in a room. It had no windows or that in it and it was horrible. I didn't like it at all. Sixteen years I was there for and I had to suffer it till I got Musabra place. A while after it closed, I went back and said goodbye to it, good riddance. And I put a broom up in the air to say good riddance to it. 33 I was when I moved to Massabra, and I'm in it ever since. And I enjoy it very much, because I've got a nice friend, Anne. Anne Johnston, Anne. She prefers. Me and Anne stays together. Anne didn't want to stay herself anymore, neither did I. So we joined in together. Hey, when I was 16, I got my first set of keys from my mum and dad, and it, it made me feel independent. But also, I think for them, I think it was it felt as though they were trustworthy to give, to give me my own key. Carla, um, member of People First. I go where lots of places, I go up there, Cricket pits up there and then around the corner. When I come uh, to people first, I talk about bullying. It's not nice. I get quite a lot of bullying. I love a pinky with my mum, my stepbrother and my dog. Happy that, that I've got a dog in the house again is... Black staffy, friendly, give you cuddles and kisses, and he's heard the door open because he know that he's gone out, and then he come back, he's still excited and wagging a tail, like. I'm happy with him, and I don't get into trouble anymore. Okay now, uh huh. Okay now. It was lovely seeing the pictures. I've not seen those before. Um, back in the summer of last year, I was I went for a walk with my children in Binning Wood in East Lothian, and we found um, a stone with a sheep, a painting of a sheep painted on one side, and then turned it over, and there was a website written with a Sharpie pen on the other side. And it was very intriguing, but this discovery introduced me to what I now know is quite a popular activity of hiding painted stones. And then you put a website on the back and people can follow where the stone goes. So this is what inspired another storybook project. And this time it was a, a project I did with families um, from First Step Nursery in Musselburgh. Um, and the children and parents discussed their favourite places and activities and they hid the stones around the town. And the people who found the stones were invited to fill in their details online and send a photograph uh, of becoming the next part of the story. So here's part of that storybook as well. On Saturday, 
Penelope is going to a birthday party. On the way, Mummy takes her to the park to hide her stone. Penelope leaves it at the top of the slide. Then she slides down. Penelope's favourite party game is musical chairs. Her mummy's favourite is Pass the Parcel. Penelope hopes they play Pass the Parcel at the party too. Everyone likes finding something hidden in the paper layers. Penelope wonders who is going to find her stone. Rupert and his big sister Martha also have a stone. Shall we go for a walk? asks their mummy on a Sunday morning. Rupert likes the sound of cars beeping and his mummy likes the sound of waves, so they go along the sea road. Maybe someone will take the stone on a boat, says Rupert. Let's put it on this bench, says Martha. Will someone find it soon? At nursery, on Monday, the children talk about where they hid their stones. Moorin left hers on the doorstep, Kenzie took his to the station, and Alistair put his in a bird-spotting hideout. Carson took his to the woods with his gran. Where did you hide yours, Finley? asks the teacher. Finley just scrunches his nose. Aaron loves swimming. If he could get on a magic bus that took him anywhere in the world, he'd go to the Muscle Buff Pool. Today is Tuesday, and Aaron has been waiting for this day for a long time. He is starting proper swimming lessons this afternoon. He will hide the stone in the changing room or in the play park on the way. Cameron goes to a different nursery. She is in the Bluebell room. On Wednesday, the Bluebells go for a walk to the park and Cameron finds something. Look! Look! It's the stone Aaron hid on the way to his swimming lesson. The Bluebells are very excited. Cameron takes the stone back to their nursery. Now they can be part of the game too. They have to decide where to hide it next. What was great about the stone stories is that I was in a class in Musselboro with the primary school uh, children at one point and somebody was putting up their hand like really anxious to say something and it turns out he had found one of these stones and he was like, I'm doing citizen and I found a stone that had the word citizen on it. What does this mean? And I was really happy to be able to tell Eleanor this story because I think sometimes you put the stones away and you just, they have their own little journey and you don't find out what happens to them. But it was really cool to be able to tell Eleanor what had happened to this one particular stone. Um, we're just going to go check back in with our people having a meal at home. They have to really wake up because we just get them to surprise them with this. You're live. Say hello. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, it's still eating as well. They've finished their dessert. Excellent. <laughs> I love how some of them are just having a bite, like they've just been waiting to be on screen so they can be seen eating. Excellent. Um, okay, so when I'm working in schools, uh, one thing that I come across all of the time, constantly, it's not just schools, it happens with adults as well, is I come across this real big fear of failure. And I think we've been talking a little bit about that uh, tonight already. But Sometimes it can be so hard to get over this fear that people won't even pick up the pen because they're so worried that they're going to get things wrong. But creativity isn't like math. There isn't a right or a wrong answer. It's all about play and exploration and giving it a go. And that's what I try and do within the classes that I'm doing for the book festival. I make it like a safe environment to fail and be silly and to get things wrong. And sometimes I even create tasks that are going to always fail. And one of these tasks I want to share with you at home uh, this evening is bad self-portraits. Um, and you're going to see a couple of examples of these bad self-portraits. So what I do is I ask young people to draw pictures of themselves, which they spend a good few minutes doing. And then I ask them to do it again, but this time with the hand that they don't write with. And they're always raging at this because they always like being really particular and not failing. And then I ask them to do it again, but this time without taking the pen off the page and they get even more raging at me. And then finally, I ask them to draw a picture of themselves with their eyes shut. I don't know what pure joy sounds like, but I can imagine it comes pretty close to 30 
10 year olds opening their eyes and looking at a picture of themselves with an arm up here, a nose on the other page, scribbles everywhere. The laughing is totally deafening and it brings me so much joy. But it's just little exercises like this that can really help people know that it's okay to fail. And it really is. And when we're being creative, that's what it's all about is just getting things wrong sometimes and not, not worrying about the pressures that sometimes school can put on us. Um, so I just love those drawings. I find them so hilarious. Um, we're gonna go back to Jeff in one second and hear some more poems about identity. Um, and Jeff's gonna treat us one called I Am. Yes, pre-COVID, uh, when the Citizen Project first came, Eleanor came in and said, relax, let your hair down. Okay, all right. Uh, I usually do what I'm told. And so I complied, and for one line anyway, I wrote, I am. I am, I ams, rattled in a shallow dish, signaling food as I walk along streets mapped by where the cat was last seen. I am glad it's summer and days are long, but am darkly aware of a stalker's mentality, skulking along venals, calling Effie and mewing. Curtains twitch, a car's headlights catch me, face on feeling guiltily innocent, ready before I'm accused to point at posters I'd earlier pinned to trees. I am sure, as a cat burglar's cover story, that it's hard to fault my endeavors in a nation of pet lovers. I'm glad the ravenous, dishevelled cat came back. I'm Chris. I suffered from vertigo since I was a child. Now I work with wood, making ladders. Sometimes I climb trees near the shopping centre, using my ladders. When I reach the top of my ladder, I climb into the tree. I sit in the branches and watch people passing on the way to the library. When I look down again, I see the ladder has gone. Someone has stolen my ladder. I should call for help, but it's such a nice day. I'm Chris. Last but definitely not least for me is a project that's still ongoing with a really wonderful group called the Warblers. The members of this group are all living with a chronic lung condition and they meet weekly with their organiser Jane Lewis um, to sing for improved lung health. Their singing sessions are currently virtual um, but if you would like to find out more you should visit their website uh, warblers.org.uk. Uh, many members of the group were recently shielding, but um, they shared memories and photographs uh, with me by letter and also by email. Um, Jane took lines from some of their stories and wrote a song. Um, so once it was safe, I began to visit the warblers outside their homes and I took my microphone with me. And right now I'm mixing together a patchwork of memories and song stories. So what you'll hear next is a sample of the work so far. Uh, my name's Dorothy McKean and I've always thought that singing can be powerful and arouse deep emotions. It can express joy, sadness. <laughs> and evoke long-forgotten memories. Singing can give us strength and resolve to carry on. Singing is my soul and singing is my cure. Singing when I am happy, singing when I am unsure. Right, my name's Andrew Scott. I used to be a part-time soldier in the TA, one of the majors heard a group of people singing a song that was meant to be their signature tune and they got the song wrong. 
they made us sing it at the square on the mountain until we got it right. I remember smoking my pipe up there. <laughs> that was actually in the song. I mind the first two, two or three lines, of it. it was, yeah, smoking my pipe on the mountain, drinking the morning dew. It's a long, long time ago, 1962. I'm surprised I still remember that. <laughs> Tell your story soft or bold All I'll sing is for young, young and old Tell your story soft and bold All I'll sing is for young and old I had been to pulmonary rehabilitation and on my last day, they told me about the warblers. And I, because I always sang, and I can't, I'm not a great singer by any standards, but I enjoy singing. And so I thought, well, I'll have a shot of that. So I went along on the Monday, and that was, what, five years ago now? And I love it. I think it's great, and it really does help your breathing. It really helps your breathing. Oh, your story softer, more, oh, sing is for young and old. Oh, I'm singing, it makes you feel good. I think it just makes you feel really happy because we all have such a good laugh. <laughs> Now I, I now I feel sorry for the bloopers on the telly. <laughs> I, I, I thought that <laughs> you wouldn't have got away with that otherwise. <laughs> he made us sing it up up in the mountain till we got it right. I remember smoking a pipe. I just think I remember the excitement of having large uh, bonfires in the evening and uh, they built a huge tower of logs and uh, they would then set a light to it and it was very exciting because these logs would eventually crash down and there'd be showers of sparks and I remember the song we used to sing was um, in the quartermaster's store and the, 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 the verses actually got, got sort of ruder and ruder as they went on but that definitely sticks out in my mind as one of the songs of my youth. <laughs> Always felt embarrassing singing in public, never even sang in church. Now I sing my heart out in the car. When my daughter Elizabeth was born, it was California Dreaming by the Mamas and the Papas. When I went into hospital to be induced, all the trees were green. By the time I came out a week later, I looked out the window at Eastern General, all the leaves were brown. It was October. I thought, that's right. The words of that song came to me, all the leaves were brown and the sky was grey. Two years earlier, when Fiona was born, it was T-Rex with their song, Hot Rock. I had to take her away as soon as she was born as they were worried that either she had a vessel missing or an extra vessel in her cord that could have affected her kidneys. It was really odd being in that ward without a baby. They gave her x-rays and put dye through her kidneys and thank goodness she's fine. They brought her back to me the next day. She's 49 now. It was T-Rex with hot rock that reminded me of that time. Singing is my cure, singing when I'm happy, singing when I'm unsure. I used to work in a nightclub in the late 90s at Wilkie House and it was called Lovely, L-U-V-L-E-Y. There was loads of stuff going on. They used to have theme nights like army, space, the beach. And they would all turn up wearing sarongs or army outfits, whatever the, the theme was. It was amazing. The club was predominantly gay, although anyone was welcome. They'd have hair ups going on in one corner. There was a hairdresser in the place putting hair up for them. There was face painting. They also had a cafe bar, and that's where I worked. And the music was house, and my first real memory of that dance music was when uh, the late George Patterson, who started the club, took me onto the balcony in Wilkie House, just watching the, the people that were just dancing in time with the music, and the place was just soaking in sweat. It was buzzing. I swear to God, the sweat was hitting the walls, and there was an amazing buzz. It was surreal. I'd never seen nothing like this in my life before. The tune they were playing was called Lock and Load, and that's where my love for dance music started. I didn't get to dance myself. I never felt confident to dance to that kind of music. 
But if I'm in the house on my own, I dance to it now, big time. Do 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 Wow, that is the second time I've listened to that Warblers audio and it, I find it so moving. Um, I know some of our Warblers are, are at home watching this evening um, and I just want to thank them so much for getting involved in this project, particularly uh, during a time where they couldn't really go out of the house to, to take part with us um, and for welcoming Eleanor to their front door so that she could record that as well. I think it's really beautiful. Um, unfortunately, that brings us to the end of this evening's event. Um, and I hope that you've enjoyed watching and listening to all the work that we've shared with you this evening. Um, it falls to me now to do a few final thank yous and I hope you'll bear with me and, and uh, not think too badly of me if I refer to my notes. I just want to make sure that I remember everybody because lots and lots of people have been involved, as you can imagine. Um, firstly, a huge thank you to all of our partner organisations. We work with multiple organisations across Edinburgh and the Lothians. Um, you can see them all on your screen now. And a, a particular thank you to North Edinburgh Arts and to the Brunton and Musselburgh, who have been our lead partners this year on the project. Um, thank you, of course, to the Scran Academy. For those people who are at home, I hope you've been enjoying your delici delicious meal. Lucky for us in the studio, they've delivered us some here, so we're going to go and get involved in those in a few minutes once we get off camera so we don't get chocolate in our teeth. Um, a huge thank you to Jeff and to Emma for joining us in the studio tonight. I think it's hopefully added a real uh, extra element having them live here with us. And a big thank you to Leila and to Eleanor for putting this evening together and for all the dedication um, they give to the project every day. It's a joy working with them both. Um, I also want to just quickly thank our site tech team here in the studio. As you can imagine, there's lots of people behind the scenes making this all happen and not cutting me off, even though we've actually gone over our time. <laughs> um, and I also want to say a personal thank you to Genevieve Fay, who's our communities programme officer, who has stage managed the logistics of this event, event to the nth degree, absolutely brilliantly. Um, this year's festival is completely free and that's thanks of course to all of our sponsors and donors um, and particularly we were so grateful to the Open University in Scotland and to the players of People's Postcode Lottery who have made this evening's event possible. My final thank you is of course to everyone who's been involved in Citizen over the last year and to everyone watching at home this evening and for joining us and coming on this journey. We had no idea what this evening's event was going to turn out like and trying to do something that um, brings about connection and community in a virtual sphere is definitely a bit of a leap of faith from our point of view. So thank you so much for coming. We will be continuing to share lots of updates of the project over the next little while on our blog. And that will include, um, as Leila said at the beginning, the uh, poem that we're hoping you've all contributed to this evening. We'll hopefully get that up by the end of next week. So do check that out. Um, a reminder is that the blog is ontheroad.edbookfest.co.uk. Um, and if you have enjoyed this event and would like to support the Book Festival's community work um, further, um, you can donate via the button at the bottom of your screen now. Thank you again so much for joining us. Um, and please do check out the rest of the Book Festival's online programme. Hope to see you again soon. <laughs>